I'm Jeremy Pico Clement. I'm really pleased to welcome you for this online technology meeting on LIDAR miniaturization. So today we are going to, to talk together about LIDAR and mainly on uh, one of the main requirements, which is the main, main miniaturization, actually, so because um, most of applications ask for compact and lightweight technology. So we will address uh, today by giving the floor for, to research and industrial experts the challenge of LIDAR miniaturization. Um, it's a live event, so feel free to ask any question you will have in the chat or by raising your hand through, through Zoom. So what is EPIC? EPIC is the largest industry association with more than 800 uh, members working in the field of photonics. So we try to act as a catalyzer for the photonics ecosystem by maintaining a strong network interaction between uh, our members. Uh, by organizing um, physical and online events, publishing markets and technology reports, organizing technical workshop, and with a lot of uh, other activities you could find on uh, our website. Um, and here you can see the EPIC team, so made of uh, 13 people, all passionate by photonics. And uh, yeah, this, this team manage and support all the ecosystem with the technology knowledge, market reports, proactive networking by organizing physical and online events and uh, easing the market access to, to our members. Uh, we support also our members in HR. We have a specific website dedicated to the job in photonics and supporting the development and the investment uh, in this industry. So this is the team. In blue, you have the event and uh, marketing team. And in red, we have the, the tech team. I'm a part of the tech team. Antonio Raspa is also a part of the tech team. And uh, okay, I'm in charge of optics and micro optic technology, but we have someone for laser technologies, uh, PIX technologies, quantum markets, and we have also Tracy for markets technology reports. I wanted also to show you uh, our next event uh, for this year. So a lot of events online and physical. And I wanted to highlight uh, the, the event related to LiDAR technologies. So as you can see, we have something on Vexel Technologies, uh, something at European Space Agency in September um, about uh, space, for, of course, online for uh, photonics for the mobility of the future, uh, Earth optimization, and metamaterials and metal lenses. So a lot of different um, online meeting and physical meeting, then you can find always uh, something interesting for your activity in your business. You can, uh, yeah, you can go to our website then to, 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 to get all information related to, to, this, uh, to this event. And I would like also to take the opportunity to talk about Fabulous, um, which is an European project. It's actually a, a pilot line for free from uh, micro optics. And it represents uh, the full value chain and consists of Europe's leading companies and R&D organization in the field of micro optics. Uh, this project offers a full range of services from optical design to pilot and volume production including tooling and material selection. And I would like to, to add also that Fabulous launches an open call in June. So feel free to ask if you have any question about this. Um, and yeah, you can reach me and uh, I will put you in contact directly with uh, Jessica Van Eck, which is, uh, who is the managing director of Fabulous. So yeah, and now I would like to also to introduce my, uh, my colleague, Antonio Raspa. Uh, we prepared this uh, event with me. Antonio, hello. Yeah, nice to meet you and nice to all uh, the participants uh, to this meeting as well uh, to all the people that are following us uh, through the YouTube channel. So uh, some words about uh, the company that uh, support us uh, in this specific meeting. Uh, Accetris, uh, who, uh, uh, who serves uh, all the OEM uh, customers with uh, microtechnology uh, infrared light sources, laser, sensor, gas flow controller, and uh, micro optical component for industrial, telecom, uh, medical, and automotive application. Then FICONTECH, who provides a cutting edge micro assembly and testing solution for the photonic industry from R&D and uh, ramping back up uh, the production until high volume production. Excelitas Technologies, who is the technology leader in delivering high performance uh, market driven photonics innovation to meet uh, lining, optoelectronic, uh, detection, and optical technology for uh, the needs of every kind of customers? IMEC, that is really a gem, an RD hub for nano and digital technologies. They can really support a company from RD to the production of cutting edge technologies. 
Imasenic. Imasenic develops a custom CMOS image sensor from uh, the specification on paper to volume production. They work with customer in a tight uh, connection from the initial specification, refining the project and making it uh, a viable products. SUS Microoptics, uh, the leader, the European leader of high quality refractive and uh, diffractive microoptics for fiber coupling, collimation and beam uh, homogenizing, based on a very long experience in optical design, engineering, and wafer level manufacturing, as well metrology and packaging, really uh, the best partner for volume production. And last but not least, yes, uh, last but not least, OFS, which produce fiber optic solution for several areas, including communication, medicine, industrial automation, sensing, and harsh environments. So these are all the friends that are supporting our meeting. And uh, let's go to see, uh, who will be today with us. This is just uh, the uh, quick view on the people that are joining this meeting. Uh, just a comment. Uh, if you are not in these uh, slides, uh, don't complain. Just register to the next meeting uh, next time. Here we have really a, a great view of all the uh, LiDAR uh, ecosystem from the end users to uh, LiDAR uh, specific manufacturer, as well all the supply chain going from laser to optics to semiconductor and pics, sensor, and last but not least, I also to name uh, the R&D, the Marketing Intelligence and Consultancy Company, as well the uh, association like uh, QPS, APIC, and Photonab. Okay, but then let's go and start. Jeremy. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. So here you can find our speakers today. Um, so we'll start with Alexis Debray from, uh, from your development, uh, Nicola Sensen from Link Technology, Clemens Hoffman from uh, AMS Osram, Boris Etchern from SHOT, Claude Florin from Fastit3D, Christophe Pache from the CSEM, Tristan Aloui from Yellowscan, and last but not least, Anura Gupta from Velodyne. So thank you very much for accepting to give a presentation and we can start with uh, Alexis de Bray. So Alexis, you can share your screen. The floor, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you. So can you, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so I will share my screen. Uh, okay. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So yes, thank you to invite me. So I am uh, Alexis Deva, I'm senior analyst at uh, Your Intelligence. And uh, so we have been working on the LiDAR uh, market uh, for uh, four years now, and uh, we are preparing our, our fifth uh, report this year. So we every year we have a a, uh, a report on the LiDAR market. And I will uh, present you some, uh, some slides about uh, our, uh, our study. Uh, so uh, our report is focused on uh, industrial and uh, automotive um, uh, applications. So it includes uh, ADAS cars, robotic cars, and uh, many uh, industrial uh, applications. And uh, we have a few uh, Okay, we have a few uh, a few or so hints on the defense and aerospace, and we do not cover the consumer uh, lidar, which is a completely different uh, technology and uh, different uh, uh, market dynamics, and uh, this is covered in some other uh, other reports. Uh, so, I will uh, here is uh, our market forecast for the lidar in the industrial and uh, automotive market. So in uh, in dollar. Uh, between uh, 2019 to 2026. And uh, so uh, today the, the, the LiDAR market is mainly for uh, topographic applications and uh, also for manufacturing. So this is a, a kind of old, old applications for, for LiDAR. And what we see is that the, the ADAS, uh, so the automotive market will, uh, will really uh, grow in the coming years 
and uh, we'll have a, a global LiDAR market uh, which will reach uh, $5.7 billion uh, in uh, 2026 uh, with a quite high CAGR of uh, 23%. And um, in uh, around 2026, so the, the ADAS market will be uh, half of the total uh, uh, LiDAR market. And uh, so there are also other uh, uh, new applications like the robot, robotic cars or robot taxi. And uh, there are also growing uh, applications of LiDAR in, in logistics and in uh, smart infrastructure uh, also. Yeah, so this, these applications will uh, grow significantly uh, in the coming years. Uh, in the, this slide, so we have the, uh, the volumes of LiDAR uh, for the uh, industrial and, and automotive applications. And so according to our forecast, we see that the uh, volume will uh, increase uh, considerably uh, in the coming years, and uh, that uh, there will be a, a huge demand for uh, LiDAR in uh, automotive applications. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, by far the largest uh, market for, for LiDAR. But there are also uh, important uh, uh, LiDAR demand for robotic cars, uh, logistics, and uh, smart infrastructures. So the, the volumes are, are smaller, but the, the growth are also uh, very uh, significant. Um, and uh, finally, so this, this is my, my, my last slide. So it's a, a mapping of the, uh, um, the LiDAR companies according to uh, the technology. So there are two axes. There is an axis uh, about the imaging technologies, uh, horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is about the uh, ranging technology. So uh, the first thing we see is that there are uh, there are many uh, companies involved in, in uh, LiDAR, and also that uh, they, 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 they use very diverse uh, uh, technologies uh, today. So, um, so we, we believe there will be uh, different uh, waves of technologies for LiDAR. So today, the LiDAR is mainly uh, pulse LiDAR with using mechanical scanning. Uh, however, so in the coming years, there will be uh, uh, the new new technologies will will, will gain uh, significance, uh, and also uh, these technologies will will help as the uh, miniaturization of the lidar. So, for example, uh, there is a flash lidar uh, because there is no uh, mechanical part, no moving part, so it's basically a camera, so it's, it's smaller, and also there is. Uh, uh, silicon photonics for uh, FMCW or optical phase array, uh, which uh, uh, allows for the integration of uh, various uh, functions in, uh, in, uh, in a single, single chip. And uh, this will help the uh, miniaturization of the LiDAR. And uh, just the last slide, so we, we have different uh, products. So uh, actual development, we have uh, market and technology reports on different topics, including uh, LiDAR, uh, silicon photonics, uh, and uh, imaging. And uh, we have a sister company called System Plus Consulting. They uh, do teardowns, and they have teardowns of uh, different LiDARs. And uh, so you can uh, uh, see these reports uh, to, uh, to understand uh, the technology uh, inside the, the LiDAR. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi, for this presentation. It's really interesting to, to start with a, with a market analysis. And just to, to be sure that everyone is really aware of what, can you explain what, what, what means, uh, what does mean 23% um, of CAGR? I mean, it's, it's a good uh, growth. So uh, yeah, so it, it's a growth. So every year it will, it will grow uh, to 23%. Uh. Okay, but it, it's, it's really great, actually. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, yeah. it's very high. <laughs> it's very high, okay. Uh, we have just one question from uh, Jörg Smolenski. Jörg, do you want to, to ask your question? Please? Yes, a second, I'm just starting my video. Hello everybody, nice to be Hello. again on an online meeting. 
Yeah, from Nanoscribe. Um, so my question is, uh, F I see a strong, there is a strong trend for FMCW LiDAR. Uh, do you think it will replace the pulse slider and in which market in all or just in a few? Uh, yes, so um, we think the FMCW will uh, will arrive in uh, around uh, at least 20, 2025 or 2026. So it's it's not it will not be uh, ready uh, uh, tomorrow. It, it takes some time to, to develop. And uh, uh, especially the, the silicon photonic chips, and um, so also um, probably it will uh, arrive first in the industrial applications it, because it's easier to enter the market since there are less requirements compared to automotive, and uh, also yes, it takes uh, probably uh, 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 three years or so to have the automotive qualifications. Mm -hmm. So uh, we cannot say today if it will replace completely the time of flight. Uh, this I, I cannot uh, I cannot tell. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for a question. Another question from uh, Wilfried uh, Noel from Swiss Micro Optics. Wilfried, if you want to ask your question. Yeah, thank Please. you, Jeremy. Uh, excellent presentation. Nice overview. I think there has been some consolidation consolidation started with some uh, mergers or acquisitions at least. Um, uh, how do you see this uh, going in the next uh, year or two years or next? Uh, do you think there will be more more mergers or acquisitions? And, and who is your most promising candidate for, for large volume and miniaturization in, in particular? Uh, yes, so there has been uh, some uh, consolidations and uh, probably will, uh, will continue in the, in the future. So uh, last year and the year before, there are, are several several <laughs> LiDAR companies which have become uh, public. So uh, it's it's they have uh, now a lot of uh, uh, financial means to develop the, the LiDAR, I would say. Uh, so uh, I could, <laughs> uh, they... We will see. I mean, as it, things will change in the coming two years, uh, uh, we believe. So because uh, they have a lot of in financial means, but also they, they need to, they will need to have some result, uh, and probably in in, in two years, uh, things will uh, will 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 change, uh, uh, especially if these companies start to have uh, less cash. So now we see they use a lot of cash on R and D. And uh, there is probably a limit on the amount they can they can use. Thanks, Wilfried, for for your question. And uh, a last question from Thomas Needing. Thomas, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Alexis, for this nice overview. Um, is there uh, already a considerable, considerable contribution of uh, lidar, especially scanning lidar, to smart farming or smart agriculture? Uh, yeah, what we see is that smart farming uh, today is a really small, uh, small market, and uh, yeah. yes, and also uh, for it's same for cameras. Uh, there are very few uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, farming equipment using uh, cameras uh, today. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, uh, okay, but Boris, if you have a really short question, to be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> hey, Alexis, uh, question to LIDAR in space. Um, do you see any other application areas for LIDAR in space besides, for example, rendezvous? Um, so do you see a huge growth here as well? or? Uh, no, we have not seen a lot of uh, growth in, in space, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK. OK. Thank you very much, Alexis, for the presentation. Thank you. Be great. And uh, now we can give the floor to Niklas Hansen from Nick Technology. Niklas, please, if you want to, to share your screen. Thank you. That's good. So my name is Niklas Hansen. I am head of application engineering at Nick Technology. I am uh, based in the Swedish office in Gothenburg and joined NILT in 2012. I'm working with a few different types of optics, but all is flat. So it's diffractive optics, 
meta optical elements and MLAs try and find the best solutions. New Technology is an optics company. We make optical elements. We stack them together to make optical components and also modules, everything based on flat optics. We also make masters with diffraction gratings and prototypes for VR, AR displays. We have our headquarters in Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, I'm sitting in the, in the office in Gothenburg, Sweden. We also have a, an office in Zurich in Switzerland and then sales presence on the east and west coast in the US. So to the topic of LiDAR. Um, LiDAR is a, it's a big space with a lot of companies and a lot of different solutions. If you look at what flat optics can do for the LiDAR industry, um, one of the biggest topics that I see is the size of the receiver module so if you have a receiver module based on refractive optics, that's typically the part that takes up the biggest amount of space in C height. And when you try to redesign this with flat optics, um, especially for telecentric systems, you can see that you can reduce the size of the, of the entire system. And it's a really significant reduction. You can also see that you can reduce the number of elements that is needed. Another aspect is also that the uh, flat optics, like meta optics, are much more stable to thermal drift. So you get a more uh, insensitive system to thermal change. There are some conditions in order to be able to reach this. You need a narrow band illumination. There's no exact uh, spec here. It depend, depends on what MTF you, you really require. You also need to have a reasonable size of the optics in order to have something that is cost effective. So here is a real example of a telecentric refractive solution. Um, it's in a black box right now, so you don't see it, but this is the size that it contains. And then we redesigned this uh, with meta optics. And you can see the, the stack contained in a black box to the right. And it's basically a massive miniaturization that you can achieve here. Now, meta optics and refractive optics are fundamentally different. So you will never have exactly the same optical performance, but in the ballpark, what you achieve here is, is quite similar. So meta optics, um, last month, we displayed a meta optic camera in, um, at Laser World Photonics a camera made of a single meta optic and a sensor. You can see um, an image here uh, taken with that camera. But I what I want to stress here is that meta optics are manufacturable. NILT has a prototyping line to quickly manufacture prototypes, but also putting together a high volume manufacturing line based on nano imprint. On the TX side, the illumination, I want to highlight for scanning LiDAR, the ability to counter the drop in relative illumination on the receiver side by tailoring the, um, the profile. So higher intensity at the corners or the edges of the line illumination. This is something we can do with quite high efficiency. And for the flash LiDAR, I want to highlight the dot projection DOEs that we make. So uh, high efficiency and also high uniformity at, at a decent field of illumination. And this is something that we can tailor to your existing system. So you don't have to change the entire system, but you can change just the uh, fan out element. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great presentation. I am really impressed uh, and uh, I have uh, so many questions, but then I leave uh, first uh, to, the, to the people that would like to, to speak. First of all, uh, my colleague uh, Tracy. So please, Tracy, go on with your question. Uh, please, okay, good. There we go. Okay, wonderful presentation, Nicholas. Um, again, 
I, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, I was uh, at one of the IEEE meetings in December and they had mentioned the ability to use metal lenses for beam steering. Are you doing anything with beam steering that you can talk to us about at this point? Well, on design level, we do beam steering, um, but it's not something we, we have a product out for, but we, we can design for, for beam steering. So if there is an application for it and, and a company that wants it, then uh, reach out, then we're interested. Thank you so much. Okay. There is anybody else with some question for Nicholas? Oh. We have Malcolm huh? from PLX, Felix. Hi, thanks for the presentation. That was really useful. I was just wondering how stable are your optics in terms of time and temperature, um, pointing stability, beam deviation, those kind of things. So, um, are you asking about the mechanical stability or? The optical stability. So, if, the, if you get temperature changes on your TX side, for example, do you get beam deviations? So, if we, if uh, it's easier to uh, look at the RX first. So, if you have a refractive lens in glass, and uh, you make a mid optic with the same uh, lens effect, then the mid optics is about ten times more stable when it comes to the focal length shift. Um, for the TX side, um, uh, I'm not sure um, that then I would have to go and, and talk to the technical guys. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, I don't see any other hands uh, raised. So uh, I prefer to go on because we have a lot of uh, speakers today. So we go to the next speaker, uh, Clemens Hoffman from AMS Osram. So the Hello floor there. is yours. So let me share my screen. Um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation. Um, so my name is uh, Clemens Hoffman. I'm from uh, AMS Osram. I'm located in uh, Germany in Regensburg, and I'll talk a little bit about LiDAR miniaturization from the laser perspective. I brought um, three content slides, one summary slide, but uh, first I think uh, uh, we, we have to think a little bit. Uh, Innovis published uh, today a nice, um, uh, article on um, LinkedIn. Um, if you look at the date today, I mean, they mentioned we should start celebrating at Amos Osram here in Germany, and he's completely right. So in the, in the US, it's May 9th, uh, what you can, uh, can see here. Um, however, in, uh, in Germany, we normally write it the other way around. So we would say it's the 9th of May. And uh, if you look at that combination, it's 905 and we are doing 905 nanometers. So today is the date for us to celebrate our 905 nanometers. So it's good to talk about them today in this, in this online meeting. So let's jump into, into LiDAR. Um, I've brought one example for an automotive car. It's a fast car. If I want to design a LiDAR system for autonomous driving and I want to get whatever, you know, best of the best maximum specification, I want to go very, very fast as we can here in Germany. So I need whatever, you know, 500 meter range. Um, so I take one of these fiber lasers, which are, you know, not celebrated today. It, uh, it takes a little bit of time for them to get celebrated. Um, and then uh, I, you know, shoot out the best I can. So let's let's assume I shoot out two kilowatt, you know, with a one nanoseconds. Um, uh, I make a dot here, and then uh, this dot I uh, I go in a two D approach uh, of scanning. Um, so I have a uh, field of view of uh, one twenty times twenty degree, and I need a resolution of maybe zero point or one degree, so that five hundred meter range, you know, with this speed, I can actually detect this this ominous tire piece of tire of ten centimeter in that distance. And then I want to have you know super high frame rate, twenty five hertz, and I assume say a system efficiency of ten percent. And then what I get is I need ten kilowatt of electrical power just for my LiDAR system. And now if you look at 
you know, batteries of our electrical cars, which have something like 60 kilowatt hours or maybe 100 kilowatt hours, driving a few hours with a LiDAR, best of the best, operating at this power might not really be what you can afford. So if you specify a LiDAR system, don't over-specify. So let's have another look. So this is now a calculation I took from OnSimi. So they published it in, in E Times. Uh, you can have a look at there yourself. Um, the PDF contains the link. And they look at 1D scanning with 9 or 5 nanometers. So you project a line in your field of view. You scan it from the left and the right. They simulate and calculate 200 meter range. So you can do something like 130 kilometers an hour. And then they come up with six watt of electrical power. So this is a factor of you know, three orders of magnitude. However, my feeling is that with 0.1 degree horizontal, and I think they have slightly less even in vertical, you cannot really do a good lighter at 200 meter, but you know, you can adapt this six watt, you know, add a few more pulses in, increases a little bit, but at least you get a decent range or LIDAR with an amount of electrical power, which you can afford in a car. And then I did a third calculation for you because we had this nice vacuum cleaner, uh, you know, in this uh, epic introduction. So uh, looking at industry where you maybe only need 15 watts to get to a 10 meter range, um, you might have slightly, you know, lower frame rates, that kind of stuff. You want to be able to have a resolution of one centimeter, then you only need 30 milliwatt of electrical power um, on average, you know, and, uh, and uh, you can use different types of, um, of components for that. So be careful if you design a lighter system, don't over specify, go with good enough for the application. I'm also an application engineer here. Um, otherwise, you end up um, with too high requirements, which cannot be fulfilled. So let's have a look at the optics. So we had a look at the power. Now let us look uh, at optics. So if you want to have a certain spot size, a certain resolution, this spot size depends on um, the aperture uh, of your laser. Sorry, that's, uh, that's here. So the size of the emission width of your laser, um, the focal length um, of your optical system, and then in the end, the, the divergence, which you have out of the laser or after the lens and it's hit and do conservation. And if you now want to go to a smaller spot size, so if you want to make this spot smaller, you have to make this one smaller and therefore you need to make your optical system larger. So that's very annoying. If you want to go to smaller spot sizes, higher resolutions that you need to make your optics larger. So one thing what can help you is making your aperture smaller. So if you're making your aperture smaller, and for example, you're taking um, one of our 220 micron aperture edge emitting lasers, and you're exchanging that for a 110 micron uh, edge emitting laser, you can make this spot from here to there smaller um, while keeping with the same optics. Um, that's you know, it and do conservation. And also here, I, I, I did rule of thumb calculation for your vacuum cleaner. So if you go from our 220 micron aperture, you go down to a 110 micron aperture. Um, so halving the aperture size, you can halve the focal length uh, and still have the same spot size. So you can just make your optical system smaller. That's something these vacuum cleaner guys would like to do. You know, small optical system in that turret um, turning around. Or what you can also do, if you leave your optics the same, you can go to um, half of um, uh, the spot size, so twice the resolution for the same focal length. So here, miniaturization also goes with picking the right um, light source with the right properties, um, so that within the given um, you know, restrictions of your optical system, uh, you can get the, res the resolution you need. Another thing is looking at technology. Um, so very briefly, I mean, you all know LiDAR, direct time of flight. That's what we are doing here is you have a laser, you send out the pulse to your car. Um, it, this pulse of light is reflected by the car and the detector detects it. And on a um, wavelength uh, uh, plot, um, you, will, um, you will get your laser emission, which is very narrow. 
However, uh, what happens now is that you also have the sunlight here. And normally, you know, summer is coming. I, I really enjoy the sun, you know, um, but our lighters don't enjoy it because also the sun puts a lot of photons to your target. These photons are reflected and they also enter your detector. And down here, I now plotted the emission from the sun and you can see it's a very, very broad distribution of sunlight, which is reaching your detector and making your signal to noise ratio much worse. So what people generally do, they put a bandpass filter inside here. So to block all the sunlight, which, you know, which is wavelength is, is outside of your laser wavelength. So you have a small bandpass filter and then only very little of your sunlight gets to your detector. That's very nice. However, in automotive, your laser needs to operate over a large temperature range. And if you look at the laser spectrum at minus 40 degree, it um, uh, has a, a lower wavelength. And then from a temperature point, it's shifting such that at 125 degree, it is red shifted. So that means you need to have a large bandpass filter to allow good operation over the whole automotive temperature range. This of course now lets through more noise. So the idea is now to have as low shift as possible from your light source so that you can make your bandpass filter as small as possible. And we happen to have done that. So uh, you can see here the wavelength shift um, over temperature. Um, of a standard edge emitting laser, um, which means that you know all the photons out of this gray box would need to get into your receiver out of this wavelength distribution. And we now have a new technology, which is called wavelength stabilization technology, which has a much lower shift over temperature. And this means that only out of this orange area, uh, uh, you need to let through all the ambient noise to your detector. Having a little look at what does it now quantitatively mean. So um, what you can do is you increase your range. So that means if the bandpass filter, this bandpass filter is only half of the size and you have still the same laser power, you can get 15 to 30% more range. So instead of 150 meter, you can go to 200 meter. The other thing, maybe nice for lighter miniaturization is it improves efficiency. So if you half the size of your bandpass, and your range is okay, you can get to the same range with 25 to 40% less laser power. So that means you can get a smaller laser, you know, smaller power supply and that kind of stuff. The other thing what you could do is often people make, you know, keep the temperature of the laser stabilized in order to select a small bandpass filter because then you have a smaller shift. What you can now do is you can remove this tech and this saves cost and size. Again, making a smaller lighter. So summing up, um, system requirement engineering, don't over-specify just because you hear that people can do a kilometer range in lighter, maybe that's you know, not applicable in the application, only on an airplane uh, or an airfield. Uh, um, other thing is optics and resolution, pick the right light source, optic size scales with increase in resolution and laser aperture and go with companies that have good technology that can save you money and size. That's all from my side, thanks. Great, thank you so much. It's very impressive. Few slides that are really stating which are the key requirements, especially going to the miniaturization of LiDAR, and also increasing the volumes of manufacturing. Tracy, what is your mind? Yes. So, uh, Clemens, this was an excellent presentation. I concur with Antonio. I really appreciated your approach. But I do have a question. It was on the uh, uh, your example for the, the LIDAR for a vacuum cleaner. And for yes. that, you showed an EL laser. Uh, have you looked at, at using Vitzels, or is there a limitation with the Vitzel as far as range? Or uh, could, the, could a Vitzel take, be used as the light source? Vixel could be used as well, yeah. If you have a package Vixel that can be used. And normally an edge emitter has a smaller aperture. So that means you could use a slightly more compact optics. Vixels mm -hmm. are normally slightly larger in size, but you could also use a Vixel, yeah. We also do Vixel, so we also can celebrate, well, maybe it's more 940, so 
wait a few days, then, then we'll celebrate them. <laughs> no, and I have seen so many new materials being used with these bitzels, and so that in turn is reducing the size. So I, there's a lot of interesting developments there. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> yes, anybody has, has some questions? Maybe I make my question. So following the presentation before of Niklas and your, uh, are you thinking uh, to integrate your uh, system, uh, meta-optics, uh, or for the moment you are still working on uh, uh, standard optics? Is it for Clemens the question? So, so um, integrating optics? Um, integrating optics. The standard optics or uh, meta-optics? So I think for the edge emitting laser currently, I mean, we are not doing systems. We are just doing the components. Huh? We are just doing the edge emitted components. You could think about integrating optics into the package, but again, here it's always very difficult. What kind of optics do you want to integrate? What is your divergence criterion? Um, all the customer have different requirements. So it's, it's kind of difficult to find a fits all customer solution for integrated optics. Okay. okay. I, I would I would like to, to ask something to yeah. Clemens, maybe maybe to ask the, 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 the epic question. Um, what can you do for the for the epic community and, and what can they do for you, Clemens? Um, so I think looking into indeed optic possibilities, but not inside the package, but outside of the package. This discussion, um, I mean with the meta optics is very nice. What kind of performance does the laser, which we supply component, need to bring so that then, you know, the other parts inside the LiDAR system, scanning, optics, thermal, can work, you know, in, in, in a good way. So how can we adjust in the development our laser so that it becomes easier for these other um, value chain people? That's that's what's interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very Anybody much. Anybody would like to comment? Not uh, now, maybe later in a private discussion. Okay, so it's time to go to the next uh, presentation from Boris Heichhorn from uh, SHOT. So, yes, Antonio, thanks a lot. Let me share my screen. Yes, sir. So can you see my screen? Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, I really enjoyed the presentations from Niklas and Clemens. Uh, it's actually going into a similar direction here. So my name is Boris Eicher and I work for SHOT on a corporate R&D level, actually doing business development, uh, already yeah, taking care of our light activities uh, since three or four years. And what you can see here on the first one is a actually a component, a class, a structured class component for the semiconductor industry. But yeah, I learned if you have a nice technology, you should try to apply it everywhere. So what we have here and what I want to present to you today is a structured class plate with interstitial deposition, as we call it, more to that in a moment, that is supposed to improve the performance of your LiDAR sensors and uh, also help you with the trend of miniaturization. So three sentences about SHOT. Uh, as you might know, we are a global company in 34 countries. So we should be also close to you, uh, hopefully. And uh, with more than 17,000 employees um, and 2.5 billion in revenue last year, for last fiscal years, uh, we um, target different industries. So uh, as you can see here, and markets like automotive and optics uh, um, are on our radar or on our LIDAR. <laughs> and so LIDAR is also a strategic initiative in our company. So for example, the protective window, uh, we are already having a couple of projects here for class-based solutions. And now coming to um, the use case for LIDAR sensors on a component, maybe we start here on the right because the pictures say more than a thousand words. Um, on the right, you can see a um, light source, a ring light source with a green light, and half of it is covered with our component. And as you can see, the part that is covered doesn't show any more any stray light anymore. So uh, if the light passes, it passes right through. And on the right, the part that is not covered uh, has a lot of stray light. So if we go, go now to the left, 
side on the LiDAR um, interior, you can see as, a, as an example for use case also the RX, so the detector side. Um, if you use uh, SPED arrays, APDs, or silicon photomultipliers, uh, in front you can also see a kind of bandpass filter. Um, that's just one example I wanted to talk today about, but I, we have also opportunities for laser side, for TX, and also even for other applications like X-ray. So what it all comes down to is in the middle, if you follow the photon through the lens system that is coming back from the field on the RX, then it passes through the component. And then in this case, hits directly the right uh, detector of pixel. But if it would come, if it came from a, from a certain extreme angle of incidence, so-called uh, stray light, for example, caused by the optics or from the field, um, and it could hit then um, a neighboring sensor pixel. In this case, in the component, you see these black areas that are um, absorptive layers. Um, the photon would be blocked and thereby um, the cross or optically or stray light induced optical crosstalk would be reduced. So it's about improving spatial resolution in LiDAR sensors via, um, first of all, a laser structuring that can enable one-to-one -one, uh, pixel registration. And finally, improving the signal to noise ratio uh, with this, we call it interstitial deposition because there are different opportunities for that depending on the design. Um, these absorptive reflective, la reflective layers to optically isolate sensor pixels. So on the next slide, um, again, we can start on the right with a nice pictures here. So around the, the photodiode uh, here in the middle, you see on top and the bottom, the different uh, structures we can create. So not, we are not only limited to straight formats, but also round and other formats. For example, if I pick the one at the top left, you see this structure into class um, and the class is not falling apart because we can also structure not completely through, we can create channels or so-called cavities and also fill those um, to achieve the performance that is required. So a kind of optical attenuation, uh, optical damping. And um, when it comes now to what we can do for you, uh, um, for example, as a sensor provider, um, we would like to support you in improving your detector performance with this component. So we differentiate it into optical, mechanical, and business reasonings. So optically, we uh, achieve one-to-one -one pixel registration with a maximum fill factor. And then we have these reflective and absorptive solutions, can be coatings, can be fillings. We have different approaches for that. And as mentioned before, um, we can also integrate a bandpass filter uh, in this component, so not to have more components, but to combine it uh, and thereby not increasing size, but of course with this component also with a better photon management as every photon counts. Um, finally, also supporting the miniaturization. Mechanically, um, we have different thicknesses uh, possible, uh, we, different materials we can work on, and a lot of, as you can see on the right, design freedom here. And on the business side, as we can do waiver level uh, processing, it's cost effective, it's scalable, and also high repeatable. So that's it in a nutshell. And if you have any questions or would like to further talk with us more in detail, um, then you can see my contact details here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Boris, for the nice presentation. Sure. And uh, I saw that uh, you put uh, clearly what you are offering to the, to the participant, your competence uh, in discussing uh, high-tech uh, LiDAR application. Mm -hmm. uh, what you need from uh, the other? So let's say the, the second epic question. What uh, can the others do for you? Yeah, of course, if they have a challenge with this topic that I just mentioned, like the stray light induced crosstalk, um, then I would be happy to be contacted because we think, and we are already working in projects here, we think that we can be of help and support and so cooperate together. Okay, great. Uh, please, uh, Boris, uh, go to... Uh standard mode, remove the presentation mode. Mm. And in the meantime, I see that uh, Tracy raised the hands uh, and also Jeremy. Okay. 
And also Rolando. Okay, first Tracy, obviously. Okay. <laughs> well, it seems like today is my day for questions. Uh, Good. So very interesting, Boris. I like the approach to be able to eliminate stray light. Uh, and so this, this uh, structured glass plate, I was wondering, how is that made? Is it cut? Is it molded? Uh, can you tell us what the technology is that you're using to make that uh, structured glass plate? Yes, um, at least uh, to a very uh, rough level, but uh, on a rough level, but it's, I can explain it via the laser structuring we are doing. Um, so the laser structuring, um, with the laser structure, we can create those structures inside the class. It is uh, one uh, process that we are developing in, uh, internally, uh, or we have developed. And then um, we can, as you can see, we can make holes, we can make channels, different kind of, um, of formats. And then there is another process step on the filling. So as mentioned, we have an absorptive layer. So that needs to be applied with a certain coating technology uh, or a filling technology, depending on the final uh, structure. That so are the are main, you, sorry, excuse me. That are the main excuse process me. steps, yeah. So are you using precision micromachining to form uh, this glass plate? Yes. You, you're nodding, I, I think that's a yes. Laser. <laughs> so, okay, very good. Um, femtosecond lasers, or do you know if it's, or is yes, it too much? I can tell okay. you, yes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Also, Thank you also, so much. <laughs> okay. Also. <laughs> Maybe they have only one or two laser, I guess, in shot. One or two hundreds laser. Uh, we work a lot with laser technology, yeah. Yes, sure. Thank you so and much, Boris. Rolando, what is your mind? Rolando from Femtoprint. Oh, uh, you can imagine the question I had. I had the same question as Tracy. I was curious to know the process that uh, that was used to uh, produce these glass plates, because I don't know if, if uh, Boris knows, but at Femtoprint, we do laser structuring of glass at wafer scale. Uh, and uh, with with the laser based technology, so I was uh, interested to know if there is an interest to discuss further the topic. Yes, sure. Let's follow up and see uh, how yeah we can come together. Thanks a lot, Roland. I will drop you an email then. Okay. Great, okay. great. That's the spirit of this uh, online meeting and all the epic meeting to set up a cooperation opportunities. And thanks so much, uh, Rolando, to, to take this opportunity. And uh, please, uh, is uh, really open to all uh, the participants. Don't hesitate to, to ask for cooperation. And uh, if something is coming in mind uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, drop a mail to me or to Jeremy, and we will introduce uh, by sure. And I see another question from uh, Malcolm Humphrey from PLX. What is Hi, coming from the other side of the ocean? I am. Hello. Uh, hi, Boris. I was wondering, does your process leave residual stress on the glass? Well, um, I can only tell you that we have also done uh, mechanical tests and they were, um, the, the result was good. So, of course, it depends. I mean, I can't give you a general answer. It depends always on the structure and the design. Yeah. Okay. But uh, there are requirements for mechanical um, stability. Uh, it's, I can already tell you, it's not as challenging as we know it from the protective window of LiDAR sensor, especially in the automotive area. Yeah. But yeah, we have done tests and it was a really good performance. Okay. I was thinking more of uh, if you had a polished glass plate, would it, would it affect the flatness of the, you know, if you had Lambda over 20, would it affect the flatness of it? Yeah, polishing is also a topic uh, that comes up frequently. However, um, I mean, in terms of total wavefront deformation, if we go now to the optics, then um, if you have a component that is installed so closely in front of a photo detector, it's not having such a huge effect as, for example, a protective window that where the light goes through it and comes back, so twice passing it. Yeah, but yeah, it's also an option. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other curiosity? I see a lot of camera that are off, so don't shy. Switch on yeah. the camera and raise the hands for any question. We have, we a, we have really... a question, Antonio, from, uh, from Wilfried. Hello. Yes, Wilfried, please, Wilfried. Thank you. Uh, very impressive, these, these, these glass plates. Um, 
actually I have like always two questions. <laughs> is it is it volume? Uh, can you produce it in volume? So several, I don't know, hundreds of wafers per day or so, or or and and what is the um, level of absorption of your layer? So what optical density is it? Mm -hmm. So uh, to the first question, uh, as mentioned before, we have uh, laser uh, technology in-house, um, also might use partners, but um, as we are working on a waiver level base, um, and you can imagine how small these sliders and detectors are getting nowadays, you get a lot of, of these components on one waiver. Um, if you work, for example, with 200 millimeter waivers, and then, um, yeah, we can produce a lot every day. That's possible. Uh, however, of course, it depends on, on the final volume um, and needs to be discussed. Um, secondly, um, your question on the absorption. I mean, there's always, as, as, as every single photon counts, uh, we are working already with uh, different materials. But if we work with very high transparent classes, for example, you still lose some transmission. That's true. And as every photon counts, we can then also apply um, our air coatings um, as the optical path where the photon is passing through is the glass itself and it's not having a layer there. Um, but there are also other designs possible where we can, so, so in, in case we use the air coating, we can reach up to 99% transmission. But in case um, we use other designs, we can even have 100% transmission. No, I meant the absorption of the absorb absorbing layers ah, okay. you mentioned. So what, what is the level of absorption there? So well, I know for the um, glass plate, I'm not too worried about absorption. The internal absorption is probably not that bad, but the question is how much, when you block light, so how yeah, much sure, light I got it. light, 1% yeah. or, or 10% or? Yeah, um, uh, it's, it's very, it can be very, very good. Again, depending on the design, um, how thick are the structures? The structures are depending on the photo detector design and so on and so on. And uh, the method used, it can be a very good um, absorption. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, achieved in one design uh, 50 dB or even 60 dB. Okay. Right. Wow, this is pretty good. Yeah. This is and, and are these channels always vertical or can they be? Yeah, good question. Angular, angular <laughs> uh, response. Uh, this is, this is um, getting yeah, very good. Cool um, yeah. I can tell you again, we have a lot of design freedom. So let's discuss. <laughs> okay. Let's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. Cool. If I can comment, uh, I really support these uh, final statements. I am uh, back from HKL in Haken last week, and uh, laser, ultra fast laser, can do nearly everything now because we are in the level of a multi-kilowatt femtosecond laser, and with the beam shaping, they can really do inside glass nearly every shape, every section, so. It's exciting time, I can just, and, there is, yeah. and now the femtosecond laser is no longer a bottleneck. When we speak about two, three kilowatt femtosecond laser, you can do a production, really, manufacturing volumes. Okay. I see no other one asking. So I will proceed with the next speaker. Now it's really a pleasure to introduce Claude Florin from Fast Free 3D. So now we are going a little upper into the value chain from the basic components. We are really going to some system integrator. So Florian, I see very well the presentation. The floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. So first, uh, perhaps I want to say that uh, we are still in the component level. Uh, our main work is on the detector side. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit uh, what's the status of the single photo, uh, photon avalanche diodes arrays, uh, in particular to flash imaging. And then what's the progress that we expect on the CMOS manufacturing on that side, and specifically 3D stacks so or wafer bond, uh, bonding uh, technology and what, what would be the impact of that. So a couple of, um, maybe as a, as a first introduction, I wanna say that this, this has been a long story. As you can see the dates on the back when Christian or Niklas was at the lab at PF, PFL before later on joining and creating the team for the, the LiDAR in the Apple uh, phone. And Lucio Carrara, our current 
CTO was working on spatial LIDAR application for that, for the rendezvous um, and the time. And now we are uh, more than 10 years later. And what's been achieved in our company is we have a demonstrator in sunlight, um, realistic driving condition of a flash LiDAR and EPFL showed a couple of years ago uh, megapixel implementation for the imaging 100,000 frames per second so all these are world first and, and in the middle I would also want to say that um, um, EPFL was leading and we licensed the technology for the first uh, 3D stack technology and of course it's well known that EPFL cooperated with ST Micro on what became a huge success in proximity sensors for mobile phones. So we have a wave, but it's been a long story. And I wanna comment on it, on it and just say where we would lead. So first, of course, where, where the, the SPAD arrays um, are good is that can enable a flash LiDAR like we have in phones and proximity sensing. But the interesting point is where can they push the, 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 the limit of the flash LiDAR functionality uh, where perhaps the scanning technology can take the relay. And there are hybrids, of, of course, it was shown by Epic slide in the, um, uh, let's say, uh, sequential scanning, uh, now being enabled by uh, addressable Vexel arrays, for example. So we are trying to push the limit. And at the start, obviously, what, what is the good advantage is this super fast um, uh, approach of a flash LiDAR. But what's going to be changing it is the ability to do digital processing on the same. So I want to talk about that. That's our status today, gives you the idea. Yes, you can have a credit size miniature LiDAR that operates up to 40 meters in, in bright, the highest summer light uh, in day and detect pedestrian and cyclist. And I may remind you that the current radars and camera cannot do it. And these are also the test specs. You see these 40, 50 meters. This is the test specs of your end cap. Nobody wants 200 meters in city driving. There's no need for that. And you also see that we don't need high power. We use the Osram Vexels in very low power. So, so there's definitely a potential, but there are limits. So let me talk about the limits. The, the main historical limits was that uh, SPAD, which should be pixel like uh, CMOS image sensor, were definitely one level uh, order of magnitude in miniaturization behind image sensor. And you know, you, you can see more than a decade of progress. And there are some reasons I just listed because in an avalanche photodiode, you need high voltage. Uh, you needed these guard rings. We need to change it. This is to avoid the crosstalk, to keep the, the electrons in, in, the, in, in, in the diode. But there's an evolution to have high pixel count with 3D IC, and I'll, I'll tell you, and much smaller pixels as well. We've been down to two micron pixel, and the story started with 70 micron pixels. So we talk, the, the progress been there, but it's been slow. So the main progress, if I would summarize it, I need to go fast on that, but essentially, if you would take an ST micro proximity sensor, for example, and you'd see that picture on the left side, we flipping it over and, and do backslide illumination. That has been a standard in image sensors. And we add a digital processing circuit below. And the digital processing circuits can now help you process the data from many more pixels. And if you have many more pixels, you can also spread the light on them. You can eliminate sunlight. So I'll show you uh, something's wrong in my animation. Oh, okay, there's an animation. Um, I'll show you two examples of what was done about three, four years ago. So that was one of the first TSMC uh, 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 pixel. On the, on the top end, you can see that we achieved the same uh, a kind of uh, uh, photon detection probability that we had with the other technology. Actually, much, much less in green and blue, but that's not a problem for our LIDARs in our use case. But you could see the power of having all these electronic secrets below, not taking space, and you know, putting hundreds or thousands of time digital uh, 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 converters and processing coincidence management. I'll show you a bit more details on this data, and that was I, I'm listing the publication if you want. But you can see that coincidence detection is a way to take out the sunlight, which is random, compared to the vexel fronts, which are actually all correlated. So you, you put time windows. 
can also do time windows in time gating and can do it progressively according to distance. So these particular demonstration were done up to 150 meters um, with SPAD with low power, okay? Low power uh, Vexel uh, illumination. So there, there's an interesting, and that's what our company is doing. We're pushing it one step further. We want to do a software-defined uh, uh, system where not only we, we process the detection, but we actually control in real time, for example, the illumination. So we change the illumination if we need more. We could change it if there are some uh, uh, interference coming from somewhere else. And if there are no interference, we don't do it. We can be a day camera and we can be night camera. And on a frame basis, so that means 1,000 times per second, you can change it. So that's the benefit of what's coming up. Uh, this particular chip, the first uh, 20K we would like to have in the first quarter next year. Um, a bit more, I'll skip it, but about what we control. We control the laser, we control the detection, we control the gating, we control the eye safety pulse. If you go below one nanosecond, then you're allowed to do 100 times more power and up to 1,000 times more eye safe power. So with these ultra short, high power laser, we do not need kilowatt anymore, okay? Kilowatt were for continuous illumination for scanning, but not for these kind of quantum detection. So. I'll close with what's the value. It's a value that goes beyond miniaturization, being beyond dividing the cost by 10, by pro but going to software defined so you can be much faster for emergency situation. That's your cocooning near range. Much safer because on a per pixel, per measurement, you always uh, uh, compute the quality control and you adjust the light. No, you know, cameras can't do that. Radars can't do that. And scanners can't do that. So you're going to be very safe. No false positive, no false negative. And then you can do some level of pre-processing in edge computing to really provide the actionable information to the post-processing chain. So you have to think of the post-processing, not so much about the LiDAR, but how does it uh, do the fusion with radar and camera? And that's the kind of test we are now doing with some of the tier one. So Thanks for your attention. We have a developer kit. What we need from the audience, we are a tiny group with nine engineers. So we actually need a lot of cooperation. We are very open to all form of partnership. We, are, we do a system to do the demo, but we don't want to make LIDARs. We want to produce chips. We are fabulous chip designer. And I'll thank some of the people who are, might be in the audience. There's Global Foundry. We primarily work with um, uh, Tower, Intel Tower, and ST Micro at this point, but uh, we already have a lot of cooperation. And I did thank uh, Osram, who's been helping us from the start, uh, from the very early Vexel IRAs when they were just happening uh, on the floor at SPIE. So we use every single model of Osram Vexel, uh, Vix Vixar, and Princeton technologies. So thanks for your attention. I hope I didn't, was not too long. Okay, thank you so much. Very interesting. Okay, any comments? Any question? Tracy, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> Normally I don't do this, but these presentations are really great. You guys brought together some wonderful companies for this online technology meeting. And Claude, I am so impressed. You're only nine engineers with everything that you've done and how you are integrating SPADs with other technology from ST Micros, Micro and the software. So with the software, I think this is a very intelligent use of, of uh, a number of different uh, technologies and how this group of nine engineers have, have been able to do this. I'm really quite amazed. Is there, is there anything that was... Um, particularly challenging with the software? Is it mostly based upon time or uh, are other uh, algorithms used in order to improve the, uh, the resolution? So first I, uh, I need to acknowledge that uh, we, we definitely work with the uh, EPFL and TU Delft and there were up to 30 people in EPFL team at the time. So that's probably 300 man years of engineering we just happen to be uh, technology transfer. We build demos, okay? Um, it's a bit more aggressive, but on the software, I think you you really uh, hit the nail and it was a little bit something I skipped. You know, if you wanna integrate these 
very so I had in the last slide, you need to control many interdependent aspects. If you change the way you, you, you detect, then, or if you change the way you, you do the lighting, how many pulse, how, what's the peak power, uh, um, uh, what's the, 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 the peak, the pulse duration, we control everything you can control. So it is a bit of a nightmare, but at the same time, this is why you need to have a system on chip, programmable chip, because otherwise you're gonna never be able to solve all the requirements. You need to be dynamic, and you need to control every parameter. So um, yeah, we, we build that. Um, I'll also acknowledge that we developed the firmware with about also, um, I would say a, a 50 man year of development with CERN and either other high energy physics because in high energy physics, you also use sil silicon detectors and you also are faced with all these um, parameters. So we have an open source background with a lot of cooperation in the US and in Europe on the topic. We just extracted from there. We hired the engineers, obviously, and we extracted from there what would be useful for an industrial or automotive LIDAR. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is amazing I, I, and dynamic, and it's done dynamically as well. So uh, thank you so much, Claude. Thank you so much, Florian. And they see that uh, Clemens uh, from uh, AMS Osram uh, raised the hand. Please. Yes, uh, hi. Thanks for the for the nice presentation and the overview. So I was wondering for these PET detectors you mentioned uh, for flash light or forty meter range. So if you you know detect again this tire, you need all point fifteen degree resolution. So that's maybe about one hundred kilopixel. If you're extending it to longer range, you are. On one slide, I briefly saw like a megapixel. Um, you would then indeed, you know, need to go to one, two megapixel. So what do you think where these spets will go? Will they reach these high pixel count rates or will they stay for, for your shorter range LiDAR? So, so my, my first answer, yes, definitely. Two years ago, uh, EPFL produced uh, with uh, Canon uh, one megapixel. And by now, uh, Canon has shown at SPIE in February where they're showing a three megapixel. So it says there's not an intrinsic limit. If we were able to do that in image sensor, in a sense, if you do one or two micron uh, pitch size of pixels, you'll be there. Now for the application we're discussing today, you know, industrial mm -hmm. thing, I really think what I want to say, we need to push the limit of flash, but there's a point where it doesn't really make sense. Okay, so so uh, we've also done numerous demo of 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 uh, uh, sequential flash uh, um, or, or or scanning. Mm -hmm. uh, so there there and as you know, in all most uh, scanners today, we use SIPMs that replace APD, who are the same spats, but we just like combine them on one micropixel. So my answers, I think the 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 limit we foresee today is about 50, 60 meters. Mm -hmm. with something that let's say maximum 90 degrees, but that would be the limit. It's probably better to think of that as an extended proximity sensor, because that we know is commercially widely available. And the 90 degrees is horizontal or vertical? It's, it's a horizontal view. Actually today it would be both, but both, that's eh? 90 times 90. Yeah. Yeah. And also I'm, I'm, I'm really not talking about optics here because that's a, not our main contribution, as mm. you can imagine. But of course, if you can do beam shaping on the transmit side, and we even wrote a small patent there, and we, we had a nice discussion with Shot, who was in the call, and, and there's nice things you can do there. So on the beam, uh, on the transmit side, of course, but then we can do a dynamic region of interest in the detection side, of course. So we can decide that uh, we measure um, the same way I show you um, uh, a progressive gating, we can do progressive readout, okay? So we might be doing, for example, uh, our goal is to do 80,000 pixels, but let's imagine the cost was not an issue. Then we would do 200 kilopixels but never all simultaneously. When we are near range, we use them to have a wide field of view. And we're long range, we do an eight degree. But again, I don't see, I think it would be an error to try to put uh, um, scanning in competition with mm. flash. I think these, this is a continuum of technologies and in which if you're smart, you can do it. By being software defined, we help people play with it. 
there, there might be industrial application where we go a bit more. We were showing in Stuttgart at Vision, we were showing 35 meters in, and we had no problem because it was in a hall and many industrial application don't have sunlight. Uh, I, and outdoor, we, we, we did test at 60 kilolux because this is the maximum sun you had in the year in Switzerland. Okay, so we couldn't get more sun. Yeah, no, of course, we could travel to Arizona and have better, but we were not, we don't have the travel budget. We are a small company. And again, we had good cooperation with Osram. I know it's not with your edge emitters for the logic that you saw. It's not, not that we have anything, uh, but we have a good temperature drift with Vexel, but now they have progressed. They were not there in the beginning. They were like us. I kept on going to SPIE and when you guys will have a real product? And then equally, you could ask the same to us, <laughs> okay? Um, it's new technology, it's a new wave, but I think it's gonna be playing in the next four, uh, you know, I would say the next five years, you're gonna see nice application there. Great, great. Great to listen to this uh, big potential. We remain in France or we go to CSCM and uh, to Christophe Pasch. So- uh, I'm, Oh, sorry, I need to stop sharing also. No, no, you stop it. There is not no longer sharing. No, no. Christophe? Yes, I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate today. You are in nearly in presentation mode. The other screen, please. Yes, I'll just swap the views. Great. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much. CSM is, um, is a research center based in Switzerland with the aim to transfer technology towards the, um, the industries and to develop new technology bricks. And this is performed through collaboration with, um, with industrial companies as well as other academic partners. And we are involved in several projects, not only in Switzerland, but also all over Europe with different um, European projects in lots of different activities, including lasers and micro optics, for example, that could be related to, to the field that we are discussing today. And as well as uh, the development of flash lidars, which is the, the topic of today on which I'll focus. And within the the domain of, uh, of LiDAR developments, we are active today in two types of LiDARs. The, the flash imaging LiDAR, where we use a direct time of flight approach with um, matrix SPAD sensor, in, enable, enable us to, to capture 3D images in one single, single uh, snapshot. This is the, the technology that I'm presenting right here. And as well as a new development towards FMCW LiDAR with the aim to target different applications since this technique based on uh, interferometry provides much higher axial resolution, except that so far the ability to capture 3D images at once is not there yet, which is um, why we are focusing on different applications that are gas sensing as well as uh, surface metrology for this FMCW. And for the flash, the main topics of interest so far were the space, where all our developments were driven by uh, requirements from the European Space Agency. And since the, the developments that we had were very well uh, suited for underwater imaging. We now also have developments towards uh, this field of application. Concerning the systems that we currently have, we, we have the, the ones, the two systems shown there that are, well, when we are talking about miniaturization, it's not the same level of miniaturization as um, a system on chip where we would have micro optics and laser diodes for emission, because the requirements that we have are driving us towards the use of very powerful lasers. We have um, fiber amplified lasers that are uh, providing kilowatts um, pulses, which 
make our systems, even though they are quite small and also uh, integrated, they are still not as miniaturized as we may have uh, in mind when we think about miniaturization. And one of the main um, components that is, uh, that is allowing us to achieve these performances are the um, detectors that are designed by the Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Italy, with whom we, are part, part, we have a partnership in ESA projects. And this device here has 64 by 64 pixels, where each pixel is a single SPAD that provides a time to digital resolution of 250 picoseconds. This allows us to create a histogram per pixel while doing our acquisition, as well as perform embedded processing based on state-of-the-art system and chip that we have integrated in, into our system. And also one key feature is the fact that we are able to change the illumination pattern either through um, illuminating the scene with one single laser or another, or by placing different diffusers in the field of view. And that where this development was driven by requirement, requirement from the space agency where they wanted to have different modes of approach for a landing, depending on the altitude at which the, um, the spacecraft would be. Concerning space, we now have a flight heritage from the remove debris mission in which we could fly a small system that was able to, to capture 3D images based on the LiDAR, as well as 2D images with a classical uh, camera. And we are continuing this development by integrating this new state-of-the-art embedded processing system within the new space approach, where not all the qualification process is followed and with the aim to launch this new, this new system by 2025 in space for in-orbit maneuvers for um, um, demonstration of a mission for in-orbit maneuvers. When it comes to underwater imaging, we see our system as being, as being vehicle agnostic where we could place these uh, small integrated lidars onto different types of vehicles that could be surface vehicles as well as uh, airborne UAVs or ROV underwater. And the good thing about the system is that it can detect multiple echoes. So it is, a, it is able to not only measure the, um, the signal from the, the bottom of the sea or the lake, but as well as the water surface when it comes to measuring erosion, for example, and there measuring the real water depth is of interest. This is a short demonstration that we've performed recently, a proof of concept in the Lake of Neuchâtel, very close to where we are, where there is um, a shipwreck that is lying by five meters deep and through a very preliminary mosaicing approach we were able to retrieve the, the 3d image of this boat and when it comes to comparing it to sonars and other photogrammetric uh, systems we think that the lidar for underwater has very small niche application where it is, for, it is well made for measuring at up to 10 or 20 meters, depending on the turbidity of the water, with very high resolution, because the spatial resolution that we provide is actually uh, diffraction limited and just consists of dividing the field of view by the number of pixels that we have within our detectors. That is actually since we placed four of our detector in the focal plenary, we now have 128 by 128 pixels. And the next generation chip will provide an inherent resolution of 256 by 256 pixels. 
Now, to address um, the, the EPIC question, the next steps that we, that we are working on today is the embedded processing, which is the reason why we now have integrated this uh, new system and chips that include both an FPGA and a processor for fast data acquisition and processing. And we're also working towards further miniaturization by replacing the, the laser source by a source which would be smaller. And for possible uh, partnerships, we are quite interested since CSCM's mission is to transfer our technology towards the industrial, we, we think that there are other applications that could be addressed with this system, probably not automotive applications since we are using green, green laser that, uh, that transmits very well into water, but not very well uh, suited for um, being on cars. But we still think that this LiDAR has other uh, niche applications that need to be, to be found. So that could be um, potential uh, interest for us to, to collaborate, as well as try finding the right industrialization partner for both the space and the bathymetric applications. Thank you very much for your attention. That's all on my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Christian. You. So do, do we have any question? Maybe I have just a, just a question. It's not yeah. more than a question. It's just uh, I would like to invite you also to, to join uh, our meeting next Monday, because next Monday we will speak about uh, nanosatellites. And uh, one of the key topics is uh, how to manage uh, and to detect debris. So really, it would be really Next Monday, three o'clock, we have uh, we will discuss about this topic. Yeah, indeed, that's a very nice opportunity. I'll uh, I'll make sure that either I will join or a colleague of mine. Sure. Right. Thank you. Please, thank you. Please, Boris, if you have a question. Come yeah, uh, thanks a lot. So, Antonio, Christoph, you're already talking about next Monday. That's also my thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm looking forward also to this event on new space. So Christoph, um, I I mean you answered the part of my question that, which I posed to Alexis at the beginning. So you are foreseeing lidar um, usage in space, for example, for space debris removal detection. Indeed, that's one application where we would have uncooperative targets that are tumbling and where we cannot actually. Um, uh, well, see, know in advance where, how they will rotate and what would be the, the rotation axis. That's one thing. Then, of course, there is also the, the landing approach for typically requirements from the space agencies are landing on Mars, where they would like to avoid hazards, avoid rocky, rocky areas or areas where there is an important slope. That could be a, a second uh, second application. Sure. And and one more question besides um, the miniaturization that you mentioned, uh, do you foresee also anything? I mean, any trends, for example, in optics? Um, uh, do you get any challenges here in the lidar sensor? Yes, indeed. In terms of optics, we so far we've been using components uh, of the shelves. But we think that if we would be able to design a lens, which is because the lens today is still an important part of our of the mass, <clears throat> the mass budget, and probably going towards um, uh, something customized and very small could be of interest. Yeah. So maybe we should connect afterwards. Yeah. Yes, with pleasure. Thanks. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Boris, for the question. Yeah, so maybe we should so just I, connect after. I have a question for you, um, Christoph. More general question, but um, are you able to to discriminate the, the material? I mean, you know, you, you you can measure the distance, but are you able to discriminate the material, or are you working on this? Um, so far, we haven't worked on that. We well, as any lidar, we have two types of images. The distance image as well as the intensity image. And out of the intensity, we may um, 
depending on if we have some a priori knowledge about the target, we may know which material is uh, reflecting more or less than the other. And we also know that through polarization, there might be an, uh, an additional contrast that could be achieved, but we haven't investigated it uh, yet. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Tracy, please. Every single presenter today, I'm so sorry. That's great. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, Christoph, I wanted to ask you, so you're doing things for, for space, uh, which means that they're very concerned about size, weight, and power. And you just mentioned uh, that the lens can be a big part of that, that mass budget. Uh, are there any other miniaturization things that you could uh, perhaps have some help with or, or that you're looking for, uh, whether it's uh, reduced power, whether it's reduced size, is there anything that some of our members might be able to help you with there? Well, another important part of the, <clears throat> of the mass as well as the, the power is the laser, for sure. And there, changing the technology would be would be probably uh, very difficult because we need very powerful laser with nanosecond, uh, typically a nanosecond pulse duration. And we've been in discussion with our laser manufacturer for knowing wh whether there might be smaller systems available. They are working as well in that direction, but of course, any, um, any source that is uh, available for very small, and powerful um, pulse laser is, um, is of interest. Thank you so much. Yeah, now we'll all have to think. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tracy, for the question. So thank you, Christophe, for the presentation. Thanks a lot. So maybe we can, can go on with uh, Tristan Alwi. Tristan, please, if you want to, to share your presentation. The, the story. Sure. Okay. Can you can you see it properly? Yeah. Okay. Good. Hi everyone. Um, first, thank you very much, Jeremy, for the invitation, and thank you for all the previous presenters for the very nice uh, presentation. So I'm here to talk about what uh, we do at YellowScan. We do uh, UAV lidar mapping, and uh, we are talking about uh, uh, point cloud. That's basically what we get out of uh, LiDAR and other components. And then you can see this image showing, um, well, a castle uh, and, and garden, French garden, that has been scanned from a UAV. Um, OK, so uh, what do we propose at YellowScan is uh, a complete uh, ecosystem, uh, including uh, mapping tools like uh, hardware components, uh, what we call LiDAR systems. Uh, we also uh, offer software um, in order to process this data acquired from um, the LiDAR. And uh, we also um, propose services like uh, support because we think that um, our customers are very important and uh, they need to get the job done with the, our system. So we have a full uh, team of uh, dedicated uh, engineers that allows to support our customers. Um, our hardware offer is uh, based on basically the, the same architecture, uh, which is presented here. So on the, on the right side, you can see um, an overview of our um, system. It's composed by, by a laser scanner. We work with different uh, manufacturers from um, Velodyne, Regal, but also in the past uh, IBO uh, and now uh, SI. Well, we are, uh, let's say, <laughs> uh, manufacturer agnostic. And we integrate uh, this uh, laser scanner together with uh, an INS, inertial and navigation system, which is basically a combination of a GNSS receiver, also called GPS, and um, an IMU in order to um, retrieve the uh, position in the GPS world and orientation of the system. And by fusing laser and INS data, we are able to um, produce a zero reference point cloud, which means like uh, in the point cloud, each point has a GNSS coordinate, which is precise to the centimetric uh, level. 
Uh, our system are platform agnostic. Uh, they include a battery and data storage and so on. So they are standalone and that can be brought on board a uh, different uh, UAV. So um, again, what we're talking about here is mapping, which is basically from my perspective, sensing is what a, a laser a scanner is, uh, is collecting different frames of data. Uh, which uh, are located, let's say, in the, in the in its own coordinates uh, system, with the zero being the optical center of the of the uh, of the scanner, and we use with the GNSS and IMU data the localization. So here, for example, on the on the left side, you have different frame of uh, a street. Um, on the middle, you have the the GNSS track uh, position of of the of the road that has been driven and on the right side you have the combination of both sensing and localization in order to um, to give uh, the end user a, a full picture of the, the the street that you've been mapping um, well this is the different platform that uh, basically you can put our lidar on any platform that is able to to carry its platform the the range Weight range varies from 750 gram, 750 gram to basically 3.5 kilos for a different solution from the uh, more compact to the uh, higher end solution. Um, well, for you see multi-copter, helicopters, even fixed wings and uh, manned, we are going into the manned uh, aircraft with a manned helicopter and small airplanes too. We are working, I mean, our customers are working on various industries. Uh, most of them, they are more in like in civil engineering or, or survey industry in order to, to map uh, terrain before operation, before construction. Uh, a big application is also uh, power line management, basically vegetation encroachment. Um, the big uh, electrical companies are looking at trees that going growing too close to their their power line and they have to to clear cut it so they they need uh, louder data to assess those uh, easily those distances between the cable and the vegetation and also uh, last but not least like archaeology uh, it's probably not the biggest business out of it but for me the most interesting application where I'm sure you, you, you've seen in the news some, some remains can be discovered be, below some heavy vegetation. Um, so that was for our hardware and application. And so we offer a solution, a software solution in order to, to process the data. Uh, so you get the point from the scanner you get the data trajectory from the INS and in this cloud station software you can fuse the data in order to retrieve a complete georeference point cloud you can well customize projection and geographical projection and stuff and export the data and uh, we offer also add-on modules that's going a little beyond in terms of processing the point cloud. We have the strip adjustment toolbox uh, that you might not be aware of it, but because GPS is about a few centimeter precision, which is also the precision of our uh, LiDAR that we use, uh, there still might be some mismatch a little bit on the data after flight. So we have a toolbox that is able to correct the trajectory uh, to a, a more precise one in order to get a seamless point cloud. Uh, we also have uh, algorithm to process point cloud and distinguish between what is ground, what is non-ground, very useful for archaeology, where you can fly over a forest just remove all the vegetation and get a map of the detailed topography below uh, vegetation. And we also offer um, a colorization module if you are able to uh, collect simultaneous uh, picture with a camera that we offer also as an option. Uh, we offer the software that able to colorize point cloud with the image uh, simultaneously collected. Uh, well, I'm, I like to show you some point cloud because it's, it's talking more than explanation. So, uh, well, those four different picture, 
um, uh, top left is uh, the terrain uh, module. Uh, you see this um, area that has been clear cut, virtually clear cut for all those trees, and you can detect, you can see basically the, the different uh, roads and, and uh, paths below vegetation. Uh, right side is a, a little more advanced classification where individual cable have been uh, detected, in insulator, poles. Um, rooftops and vegetation and based on this data uh, there's further processing can be made in order to measure distances and buffer uh, distances from the cable to the vegetation and the two picture on the bottom is showing a colorized uh, point cloud with the simultaneously uh, acquired images like with uh, Sony uh, DSLR camera and um, so, uh, what what can we what do we need now? Is uh, as I said, we integrate different uh, sensor from different manufacturer, and we are always looking for a new solution, new sensor, new new laser scanners. Uh, we don't really mind about which technology is used: is moving part, no moving part, flash lidar, or uh, whatever uh, the the technology is able to provide the solution that we. We would like. Uh, so we have in Europe a law that uh, allows a UAV to fly up to 120 meter. For us, how higher we fly, more the productivity is. So we would like to fly 120 meter above the ground with our drones and our LIDAR. So which means if we consider a, a certain field of view a scan angle, uh, basically, would like to end up with a 200-250 meter laser range at 10% reflectivity. Uh, ideally, would like to get the centimetric precision, one to three centimeter uh, repeatability. Uh, this is what we are looking at, and uh, ability to detect target below vegetation because this is a really key differentiator of, uh, of LiDAR compared to photogrammetry. So we need the multi-echo technology and uh, dimension, I would say, as, um, as, um, as light as possible. Below 500 gram would be great. You know, that's the kind of my Santa Claus list, uh, but we are, we are getting today something which is really close to this uh, at the moment with a LiveOx uh, company in, in China. So um, we are very open to uh, project collaboration, uh, collaborative project. So if you see any solution in your portfolio or if you need to develop something, um, maybe we can work together. Well, thank you very much. Um, for listening. Thank you very much, Tristan, for the presentation. Really interesting to see uh, how you use uh, this technology, the dark technology. Really great, thank you. Do we have some questions? Okay, maybe I can, I can start with, with my question. I, I just wanted to, to know um, how much the, the miniaturization um, is important for you. Um, can you. Can you tell us more about this? Sure. Uh, well, so um, for me, this twofold is the flight time because lighter the payload is, uh, longer the flight time will be. Um, so we are looking at always lighter uh, solution in order to be uh, carried longer. And also looking at lighter solution allows us to bring our solution on board smaller drones that maybe are cheaper uh, or easier to operate because, you know, from, from the low perspective restriction, um, the, if, if small drones are more Allowed to do things than bigger drones, so that's that's twofold. Like, uh, yeah, flying longer time and and be able to to retrieve okay. smaller platforms. Okay, thank you. And uh, okay, we have two questions. Uh, Christoph, please. Thank you for the interesting presentation. You are mentioning the the fact that you you are interested at technologies that can see through vegetation. But it seems that you you are already able to to do it. Is that correct? 
Yeah, yes, you're right. It's, it's just that sometimes lighter manufacturers, they, they provide solution, but it's a single eco. And this is where I meant we are not really interested in a solution um, unless there are multiple eco because we need to see through vegetation. Okay. But yeah, yeah. That, that's that's why, of course, all of our system already see through vegetation because they use multiple eco. But uh, you know, sometimes I've been proposed with nice technologies, uh, but they are not able to record multiple eco. That's that's what I was uh, meaning by this uh, slides. Okay, thank you for the explanation. Thank you, Christoph. And we have another question from Clemens, please. Yeah, Christoph, thanks. Uh, so I was wondering, did you check on different wavelengths, you know, and, and can you maybe elaborate a bit more on which technologies like FMCW, direct time of flight, um, you know, are better to go through vegetations uh, uh, than others? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. So, so far we are using off the shelf solution. So basically 905 nanometers from basically Velodyne sensors mm -hmm. and uh, some of other, which is uh, 1500 uh, from the fiber optic um, mm -hmm. lasers, but we, we are staying in the infrared uh, domain. I, I'm not that familiar about uh, other, let's say technology, um, so I would be really happy to, to learn more about it and maybe uh, think about what could be developed. So, so far, penetration into vegetation for us is, is the laser going through small gaps between leaves, basically not, mm -hmm. not really going through the, the, the leaves itself, but just finding the path to, uh, down to the, um, down to the, the ground. Uh, some of the lasers that we are using, they have multiple lasers in multiple direction, like multi-channel uh, velodyne uh, light scanners. So they, they are pretty capable of going through vegetation because of all those um, different angles, which is pretty nice. But I guess a flash LiDAR would, would make it too. Um, but we never had the chance to test it so far because the close range is, um, let's say 30, 50 meter is not enough for our, mm -hmm. our application uh, because not only about the regulation, um, it's also about the uh, uh, flight safety. Uh, pilots don't want to fly too, too low. And if you can imagine a, a high um, trees hide by 30, 50 meter, uh, we really need to be at least tw 20 meters off the, of the tree, so mm. basically 70 meters off the ground. Thank you, Clemens, for the question. And um, okay, if we have another, one of the questions, I think it's okay. Thank you very much, Tristan, for your presentation. Thank you. And if you want to, to be put in contact with, with Tristan, do not hesitate to, yeah, to contact uh, Antonio or, or, or me. Thank you. And um, now, last speaker for this uh, OTM, Anurag Gupta. Anurag, are you still here? Yes, I'm still okay, here. Okay, perfect. So the floor really, is yours. Really, all right. So give me one second to share. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, really nice um, collection of talks. I learned a lot. Thank you, all the speakers. So um, I'm the EVP of engineering at Velodyne, and I've worked on both flash LiDAR technologies um, as well as a variety of other technologies. I started working with LiDAR at Waymo, where I built help build the Google's first uh, optical engineering team for there. And um, I think this this is a really nice topic, LiDAR miniaturization. And uh, so LiDAR miniaturization and the cost, these two are primary drivers for this industry's wide scale adoption up in the future. And uh, we recently released this um, really nice product, I think. This is the Velaray M1600. And um, so, it doesn't make a lighter this small, but still it's it's a dent from where it is today. Uh, I hope you guys like it. Um, so this is our product. This is already released. Uh, we have shipped thousands of these sensors. So this product is very much customer inspired. A lot of customers came to us 
asking for this kind of uh, product. Autonomous mobile robots are the primary application for this. It has a nice sleek embedded design, produces a dense point cloud with only 11 watts of power consumption. It is splash water and dust resistant with both indoor and outdoor performance. It has dual return mode. I'll talk about it later. Um, we have done a lot of perception-based training for this, whichever customers are now using it. And uh, for ranges of 0.1 to 30 meters, it can go much, much longer. It can cross 100 meters easily. Um, and it has a pretty big um, field of view, horizontal, it extends more than 120 degrees and vertical 32 degrees. And, um, and software development, I think it's a, it's a very much critical to uh, miniaturizing the LiDAR because it allows us to use the LiDAR systems uh, better in an in integrated environment. So it's not obvious, but um, once you add sufficient capabilities, it leads to miniaturization. And um, this, is, this product is ideal for sidewalks, commercial and industrial settings. As, and this is something very much um, we are basing it on the feedback from our customers. So let's see, the next slide. So this is um, rough size on the dimensions. Uh, about, it's about 180 millimeters long, 55 millimeters high, and about 76 millimeters deep. Uh, not the tiniest, but it's still uh, quite compact in a sleek package. And um, the aesthetics was important, like several customers did ask for the aesthetics. So we made sure that it integrates very seamlessly into their uh, overall products, industrial um, ID. Uh, I'll show some pictures about it. So for example, this, uh, this is one of the autonomous mobile robots. And you can see how the product has seamlessly integrated into the product. And uh, our Vela development kit software allows uh, further ease of integration. It has low form factor and low power. So power is very important because if, if it consumes like, and this power consumes every, like it's that 11 watts includes everything. It includes the entire compute engine. So you don't have to have a processor somewhere else. That's a total heat dissipation. So it's easier for integrators to handle low power at a system level. And um, here is a dual return mode. What it does is it increases the number of usable points. And um, our, again, our customers provided that this was a very powerful mode. It allows the detection of small objects and hard to detect surfaces. And this is an actual um, robot um, it has been used for, uh, the picture that you see. So it is a short video. Let's hope it plays over the Zoom. It's turning data into action. So it's optimized. We have our software optimized for roadways, warehouses, and sidewalk environments. So uh, this is how it appears. And as you can see on the bottom um, right, you have this actual live camera scene. And uh, we are able to uh, easily overlay people, cars, and identify objects, classify objects. You can see the pedestrian crossing across. And uh, so this is, this is very powerful because again, like this is um, happening on the platform live uh, within the same power envelope. So how do we make it work? So this is the secret sauce behind it. It's a micro LiDAR array. So um, as you can see, this is next to uh, a quarter and um, how compact it is. What, what we have done is we have created an, a custom ASIC. It has um, been in development for a very long time through various iterations and then an optical chip. What the optical chip is doing is it's miniaturizing all the LiDAR channels into a penny. So combining the ASIC with the optical chip, you end up with something like a micro LiDAR assembly. So this is the heart of uh, this M1600 uh, Velodyne's tech latest te technology. And it allows this kind of uh, miniaturization of both the 
the form factor as well as the power. So the size comes in these three flavors. You got, it's not just the physical size. It's the physical size. It's the size of the power. And then it's the size of the bandwidth. So all these three things need to be miniaturized in order for ease of product integration. And um, playing, paying attention to both optics as well as electronics has helped us reach this far. And obviously there is a long road ahead. So I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwar. Thank you for this really interesting presentation. I think, that, yeah, we have, okay, we have a question from Boris. It's from Comshot, please, Boris. Yeah, <clears throat> hello, Anurag. Uh, great uh, presentation, great product. Um, I have a question regarding um, the protective window. Um, so far, I thought that the, the requirement from having a, a plaque or not see-through window is rather driven by the automotive industry. But do you see that also in the industri industrial industry, uh, like indust for industry applications and other applications that it should not be, nobody should see into the lighter? I'm not that aware of that uh, particular, but what it has turned out to be, these have bandpass filters and these are bandpass filters in the, in the uh, near IR. So it does lead to a kind of opaque coating that uh, gives you this form and feel. But I don't think so. We tried to deliberately make it opaque uh, hmm. uh, looking into the uh, LiDAR itself. So uh, now there may be requirement. I have to um, acknowledge my ignorance about it. But whenever I've seen these kind of uh, bandpass uh, coatings in the near IR region, I've always seen this kind of, you can see that in telescopic lenses, camera lenses also, when you put this, they have a very strong, like opaque, uh, even in the visible domain, where you put these powerful band, band pass filters in the visible, you kind of like ends up making the optics opaque. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Boris, for the question. Grigory, please, from Omatilia. Um, yeah, very nice. Now, a bit familiar with the, the, the puck, right? Your, your, your small one. Yeah, small puck. Was, yeah. This one was very small. But this, this is different technology, right? So there's no scanning anymore. There's still scanning involved. It, so it does have an internal scanner, so but it is minimized. So, but it it's almost solid state, I would say. So I wouldn't say that it has no moving parts at all but um, it's, a, it's a very much a directional array. So it does have some kind of scanning. Okay, and, and, and you clearly uh, aim at, um, how would you call this, uh, robotic, right? I mean, um, uh, I mean a LiDAR that, that's on, on a system, I mean, a robot whether that moves in a warehouse or somewhere else. Right? Yeah. So that probably means that then resolution, at least distance is, is less, right? You, you don't aim at uh, whatever, 300 meters, right? Um, I guess, which probably also helps for resolution, if, if I'm right. So the resolution is pretty much angular. So angular resolution wise, it is pretty decent of the order of, or depending upon like, you know, which angular mode you're talking about 0.1 to 0.3 degrees. So angular and the angular is because it's angular resolution, it's constant across the distance. So, um, so now the thing is the selection of the distance is very much also based on like how power hungry we want the system to be. So um, we can easily extend the range. That's not a problem at all, but a lot of applications don't necessarily need that. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. And we have um, an another question from Swiss Micro Optics mm -hmm. Wilfried, if you want to ask a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. You mentioned this optical chip. Um, what exactly is special about it? Is that a pick or is that an array of waveguides, a face array? Or can you say a few more words about the underlying technology or uh, the, what you, why you call it an optical chip? Or is it just an array of, of assembled pieces? Or can you say a few more words about this, please? Yeah. So I think uh, you can call it almost a, like a micro optical table. So it has very much classical passive optical components, uh, does not use fancy stuff like waveguides or, or any face plates or anything like that. But um, it is a miniaturization long time coming. Like 
how do we pack a wide variety of optical components, passive optical, classical components into a really, really tiny package that you cannot even see with your bare eyes. So hence uh, the wording, optical chip. Okay, thank you. Pretty cool. <laughs> it's always this hybrid approach that in the end uh, brings things forward. So it's when you I wait so. for the next level technology, you might wait too yeah. long and then you have to find an hybrid solution. So yes. uh, very, very good idea. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anurai. Good presentation. Thank you very much. We are, we are on time. So it was quite a challenge with uh, eight, eight speakers. So I would like just to to share my screen and to, to share the last slide, the similar slide. Um, okay, I think it's okay for you. So yeah, firstly, I would like to, to thank all of our today's speakers. Um, so it was a real pleasure for me um, and for us to, to prepare this event on leader miniaturization. And I think that you, we all know that our miniaturization is uh, important for global use of this technology. But today, I think also that um, our panelists bring a real overview of the challenges, uh, what we can expect in the next few years, and what which what are the application and next application. So we try to to cover all the value chain for the component manufacturer to the use case. So yeah, thanks again to our speakers for the highly relevant presentation. And to quickly summarize the today's OTM, um, yeah, we have seen that the leader market is really growing a lot, uh, twenty three percent of year zero. Uh, it's a sign that the market is and will be really attractive in the next few years, um, even if the market is and will be dragged by ADS application. We have also seen that robotic and smart infrastructure uh, are really interesting in terms of growth. Um, and about components and technology, uh, here again, a really interesting presentation. We had the relevant point of view from AMS Osrams with Clemens uh, about requirements and what is important when you have to choose the leader technologies. Um, interesting presentation from uh, Neil Technology, as usual, uh, and uh, on how uh, meta, uh, meta lenses, optical elements uh, will bring a real revolution in terms of miniaturization of LIDAR. And the same from, for ships based LIDAR technology from Fast 3D with Cloud, uh, which will help to overcome miniaturization challenge. And we had also the presentation of a new optical component from SHOT. Uh, which uh, helped to improve the signal noise ratio and so the leader performance. And uh, yeah, about the application cases, we're interesting to see the possibility and uh, opportunity on this market in terms of application from the space uh, debris to robotic industry, including topography. So yeah, thanks a lot to CSM, Yellowscan, and Velodyne for this relevant presentation. And thanks also a lot to our uh, participants of this studio team. So now I think we can close the session. We can close the live on YouTube, but you can, if you want, uh, stay with us. Uh, if you want to discuss with our speakers, if we have more, more questions, you can stay a little bit more with us.